when they need them. Thank you very much. That concludes general questions. We turn now to First Minister's questions. Question number one from Ruth Davidson. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Six years ago, this Parliament introduced new rules so that parents could get more information about their local school. The 2012 Education Scotland regulations were crystal clear. Pupils and parents needed schools to provide comprehensive information, particularly on their curriculum, including on subject choice and on school performance. Can I ask the First Minister, six years on, how many schools are actually complying with these regulations? First Minister. I don't have access to that specific information in front of me. I'm happy to write to Ruth Davison with the information uh, after this session. Uh, but there is a wide range of information available to parents about the performance uh, of schools, about the education system in general. Of course, one of the things uh, this government is determined to do is improve uh, the information that's available about how our pupils are performing in schools. That's why we've uh, introduced uh, standardised assessments to replace the assessments that were previously uh, underway by local authorities. Of course, uh, contrary to what they previously have said, uh, the Scottish Conservatives now appear to want us uh, to move away from that. So we will continue to take steps to make sure that there is good quality information for teachers to help inform their judgment about pupil performance, but also for parents about the performance of their children and the schools that their children learn in. Ruth Davison. The answer to the question that I asked was just 7%. That is according to new analysis by Professor Jim Scott of Dundee University, which he'll be presenting next week in a detailed paper on education and parental information. Schools should, according to this government's own rules, give parents clear data on the curriculum and on performance. That's so that parents can find out about the school that they're entrusting their children with, or, where appropriate, make an informed decision about which school to choose. Yet, according to Professor Scott, Six years on, the parent who wishes to make an informed choice of school has relatively little hope of doing so. When more than nine out of ten schools fail to publish the information that this parliament requires of them, isn't he right, First Minister? First Minister. Well, schools, schools already uh, publish a range of information. For example, uh, there is a dashboard uh, which covers uh, broad general education. Schools also publish, for example, information on subject choice. Um, I want to see uh, parents have more information about the performance of uh, their children. That's why we have standardised the assessments that were previously in place, uh, including at Primary 1, in order that we uh, are ensuring that teachers know whether uh, young people are meeting the benchmarks that are set by Curriculum for Excellence. I'm a bit confused, I have to say, about Ruth Davidson's line of questioning today because she's asking me to provide more information about the performance of young people in our schools and yet the Scottish Conservative Party are also asking us to abolish uh, the standardised assessments for primary one that does uh, just that. So Ruth Davidson appears to be a bit confused about her own education policy. Ruth Davidson. The First Minister says she wants more information, but she's not even making sure that the information that this Parliament requires of schools is being put in the public realm. 7% is shameful. And here's why this matters. This government says that we need parents to get more involved in schools because that's how children learn better. And I agree. Yet in Scotland's secondaries, it's quite clear that too often parents are being left in the dark as to what is actually going on inside the school gate until they suddenly discover halfway through their child's school journey that subjects they thought were on offer aren't. This government knows that more needs to be done, which is why it launched a new action plan on increasing parental involvement last month. So why won't it put this action plan in law so that we can actually see some action? First Minister. Of course. Do you know what? Uh, based on our experience around standardised assessments, which the Conservatives called on us to do uh, and are now asking us to abolish, if we were to announce tomorrow that we were going to put this uh, parental engagement strategy in statute, as Ruth Davidson has just asked me to do, I would guarantee you that the Conservatives would decide that they suddenly oppose that. Yeah, because yeah, when it comes yeah. to measures to improve our education system, uh, the Tories are good on rhetoric. Uh, but they tend to put short-term party political interests over the interests of pupils in our schools. So, as I said, we publish a range 
of information. Uh, for the last uh, three years, we've also been publishing information on the curriculum levels at P1, uh, 4, 7 and S3. So we will continue to look to extend the range of information that parents have about the performance of children in schools. Uh, I just say again, it strikes me as being rather strange that Ruth Davidson is uh, pursuing this line of questioning today, when, as I understand it, uh, next week the Tories will bring forward uh, a motion uh, to ask us to abolish standardised assessments in P1, which are all about providing more information. I think the Scottish Conservatives should really sort out their own position on these matters before coming to ask me questions about them. Ruth Davidson. Uh, the First Minister has the gall to stand there and talk about anyone else inflating their education rhetoric. Yeah. This is the woman that stood here a year ago and heralded a flagship education bill as the most radical transformation of our schools since devolution, and then she promptly threw it in the bin. But let's get back, presiding officer, let's get back to the question that I actually asked her, which was about the action plan that the Deputy First Minister launched just last month. Perhaps in that instance, she didn't see the calls from organisations such as Save the Children, who said we had hoped that this plan would be underpinned by legislative change. It is yet another letdown from a government that has proved timid and weak in improving our schools. A government that dumps its own education bill because it finds it too hard. A government that introduces an action plan but refuses to put it into law. And a government that brings in new rights for parents and then won't enforce them. The First Minister says that education is our top priority. But isn't it the truth that when she's put to the test, any test, she fails? Yeah. First Minister. Well, on, on the education bill, we are taking forward uh, the proposals that would have been in that bill much more quickly. I think that is a good thing. In terms of the parental engagement strategy, we will take forward the proposals in that. That, of course, has the support of uh, COSA and, perhaps more importantly, uh, the National Parent uh, Forum. But Ruth Davidson's hypocrisy on these matters is absolutely breathtaking. I'm going to read something out. She asked me to make available more information uh, so that people know how young people in our schools uh, are doing. Let me just read out something to the Chamber. Uh, we welcome the Scottish Government's recent decision to reintroduce national testing in primary schools. It is an admission that the current system has not been good enough. Uh, we believe that the Scottish Government needs to be far bolder in measuring progress in our education uh, system. The Scottish Government should design the new standardised tests at P1, P4 and P7 to fit international methodologies. I've just read out the Scottish Conservative 2016 Manifesto. And yet, I understand that next week, the Scottish Conservatives are going to vote or bring forward a motion for the abolition of standardised assessment uh, at Primary 1. Uh, the hypocrisy on these matters, presiding officer, I think is breathtaking. And what we see from the Conservatives is that they are shameless opportunists on these matters. They do not care. They care only about the short-term political opportunity. They care not a jot about school children. They care not a jot about standards in our schools. And I think Ruth Davidson has revealed that yet again today. Question number two, Richard Leonard. Uh, presiding officer, uh, today's report from Audit Scotland reminds us, and I quote, that children living in low-income households are three times, three times more likely to suffer mental health problems than their more affluent peers. It also makes clear that access to Scotland's mental health services for children and young people has not got better during Nicola Sturgeon's time as First Minister. It has got worse. First Minister, why is that? First Minister. Well, demand is increasing for mental health services. We welcome, I very much welcome, the Audit Scotland report that has been published today. Uh, that report confirms that spending by National Health Service boards on children and young people's mental health uh, has gone up by just under 12% in real terms since 2013. Uh, the CAMS workforce uh, has gone up by 11% since 2014. So the system is seeing more patients. Uh, it's seeing uh, more patients within 18 weeks, but demand is growing faster. Uh, as the report this morning shows, there's been a 22% increase in referrals uh, to CAMS. 
Uh, the report also is right in saying that the system is geared too much towards specialist care. So the plans that we set out uh, last week in the programme for government uh, are designed to address exactly that investment in school counsellors and school nurses to ensure that every secondary school has a counselling service, uh, mental health first aid uh, treatment being available for teachers and of course the establishment of a community mental wellbeing service for five to 24 year olds. I would hope Richard Leonard uh, would welcome all of these initiatives. Richard Leonard. Uh, let me be clear, First Minister. I asked, why have things got to crisis point under your watch? Not what was in your programme for government last week. And after all, that was the SNP's 12th programme for government and your fifth as First Minister. This summer, the government at last published a review of children re rejected for mental health treatment. And it revealed that some young people were being turned away from treatment even though they were self-harming. Does the First Minister even begin to understand the human cost of that, the damage done, the lives changed irreparably? And does the First Minister even know how many of these referrals have been rejected since she took office? First Minister. I absolutely uh, understand uh, the human cost when the National Health Service, mm -hmm. either in uh, mental health services or physical uh, health services, uh, do not provide care uh, as quickly as we want it to. Uh, Richard Leonard asked me about performance uh, under uh, this government. Uh, the key thing here about mental health, and you know, I, I think this is widely recognised, this government has invested more in mental health. Uh, there are more people working in mental health, including in children and adolescent mental health services. The system is seeing more patients. It is also seeing more patients within 18 weeks, but demand is rising uh, faster. And as I've said many times before, that is a good thing because it means the stigma associated with mental health is reducing. So what we have to do is continue to build capacity, which we are doing, but also make sure we're building capacity in the right uh, places. Too many young people are referred to specialist services when that's not necessarily the right option for them. So uh, what I uh, said a few moments ago about investment in school counselling, uh, the new community mental wellbeing service, these are important initiatives uh, that we are taking forward. Uh, and as we do that, we also ensure that specialist care is there for those who really need it uh, as quickly as possible. Uh, I hope that people across uh, this chamber will get behind these plans because they are the right plans and in the interests of young people across the country. Country. Richard Leonard. Uh, presiding officer, the exact question I asked was how many referrals for treatment had been rejected since Nicola Sturgeon became First Minister? And the answer is almost 25,000. 25,000 cases rejected since you took office, First Minister. Now, today's report calls for a step change, and Labour will work with the government to deliver the changes that we need. That's why. We press for councils in schools and for a review of these rejected cases. But the reality is that the government has been too slow to act because it did not take this issue seriously enough. So with thousands of Scotland's children rejected for treatment during her time in office, surely the First Minister must show an ounce of regret that her government did not act sooner. The new Minister for Mental Health has today admitted that too many children and adolescents are being let down. So will the First Minister admit that she has been too slow to act, that she has let these children and young people down for over a decade, and will she today offer them an apology? First Minister. Well, can I say, uh, f first of all, in in all sincerity, I, I regret and apologise to any patient, uh, whether they're an adult or a child, uh, that is not seen by the National Health Service, either for mental health problems or physical health problems, uh, as quickly as they should be. And I say that un reservedly. Uh, but I don't accept uh, Richard Leonard's characterisation. As I've said before, in the Audit Scotland report recognises this. We have put additional resources into mental health. We've seen uh, additional people employed to work in mental health. Since uh, 2007, uh, the CAMS workforce has increased, I think, by 69%. So we have recognised the rising uh, demand on mental health services and we've acted on that. However, demand has risen uh, faster than I think anybody necessarily anticipated, which I think is a good thing. So we recognise we must do 
even more, not just to build the capacity of specialist services, but also to build the capacity of community services. On rejected referrals, it is exactly because we were concerned uh, by rejected referrals that we set up the audit of rejected referrals. Uh, Denise Coyer, of course, is uh, looking at this and published her first recommendations this very week, and there will be a new national CAMS uh, referral criteria uh, published later this autumn. Uh, so we are acting and we've set out further plans. Uh, what I would say to Richard Leonard, and I, I welcome this, if he is serious about working with the government to take forward these plans, then I welcome that, and perhaps we can build some much needed consensus on a very, very important issue. Thank you. We have some constituency supplementaries. The first from Jamie Green. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Uh, the Adrosan Iron Ferry is a lifeline service for residents and quite a vital part of its tourism industry. Unfortunately, this past year, that service has been severely disrupted due to continuous cancellations. Once again, the Isle of Arran is offline for technical reasons, and only half of the timetable services are currently running. It's not just this service, First Minister. Right across Scotland, island communities are being, letting, are being let down by an ageing fleet and a lack of new vessels. The new vessels promised already over a year late. Does the First Minister understand why Scotland's island communities are quickly losing their patience with this government's inability to provide them regular and reliable ferry services? And can I ask her to take this up with the Cabinet Secretary for Transport so that he can deal with this as a matter of priority? First Minister. Transport Secretary uh, deals with these matters on a daily basis. I'm sure he would be delighted to meet with the member to discuss them in more uh, depth. I, of course, am aware, as is the entire government, about pressures on the ferry network. We understand the impact that has on people's uh, lives and businesses in our island communities. I indeed heard firsthand from communities in Arran uh, when the Cabinet recently met in Arran about the pressures that increased visitor numbers are putting on these lifeline services. These are complex uh, challenges, but we are determined to improve uh, services. We've invested significantly in ferry services and we continue to work to address uh, these issues. Over a billion pounds has been invested in ferry services across the Clyde and Hebrides uh, since 2007. Eight new ferries have been added to the CalMac fleet since 2007. We are continuing to invest in new vessels and ferry infrastructure to renew the fleet. Two new vessels have been co commissioned from uh, Ferguson's uh, shipyard. So a range of work is ongoing and will continue to be undertaken to make sure that those living and working on our islands have the services they deserve. Bob Doris. Thank you, President Officer. First Minister, can I draw your attention to the plight of my constituents, the Bakish family, who have had their appeal for asylum rejected by the UK Home Office, despite being at very real risk of religious persecution and in danger for their lives should they return to Pakistan. The community in North Glasgow, where the family have stayed since 2012, have rallied around them. Their two sons, Somer and Arib, were joined by school friends and the moderator of the Church of Scotland and handing in a petition to the Home Office signed by 85,000 people in support of the family. Does the First Minister agree with me that the need for a petition in the first place to draw attention to the plight of the Bakish family demonstrates just how fundamentally flawed and discredited the UK asylum process has become? Will you offer the family your support and best wishes? And, ca and can the Scottish Government, as I have already done, also make representations to the UK government drawing attention to the path to the family's plight. First Minister. I agree wholeheartedly with the sentiment of Bob Doris's question and I agree about uh, the deficiencies in the UK government's asylum and immigration uh, regime. The Scottish Government believes very strongly that asylum seekers must be treated humanely and fairly with their dignity and rights upheld at every stage of the process. The Home Office it has a duty to ensure that full account is taken of all the individual circumstances in every case and this is particularly important when applications uh, are refused and absolutely imperative when children are involved. Uh, I'm very heartened to hear how the local community has rallied around the Bakish family and about the response to the Reverend Pollock's petition. Uh, I would also like to congratulate Somer and Arib on what they have achieved in very, very difficult circumstances. They are an absolute credit to their parents, their school, their community, and indeed they are a credit to Scotland. So the Scottish Government will continue to look at what appropriate representations we can make. And Liam Kerr. Thank you, President Officer. Montrose Port is a key industry in Montrose in the North East. Keeping the port open requires dredging and disposal of sand. 
Now, last week, contrary to expert marine consultant advice, Marine Scotland refused to renew the port's disposal licence. And the next time there's a strong easterly or swell, the port could silt up, lose depth and potentially close due to inability to dredge. So will the First Minister instruct the Cabinet Secretary and Marine Scotland to immediately visit the Port Authority to, at the very least, issue a temporary licence for 12 months and prevent an economic and social catastrophe? First Minister. Well, I'm very happy to ask the Cabinet Secretary to engage with the Port Authority. Uh, I'm sure the Cabinet Secretary would also be happy to meet uh, with the member to look uh, at these issues uh, in great detail. I'm sure they are already being looked at in great detail and take whatever action is considered appropriate. Question number three, Willie Rennie. The First Minister will have seen the comprehensive letter at the weekend from the Teachers' Union, the EIS, on the review of assessments for five-year-olds in school. The union states they have created a high stakes environment and a slippery path to league tables. They are swallowing up time and drain resource. The first minister promised this would not happen and yet the teaching union disagrees. What more evidence does she need that these tests should go? First Minister. Well, I have to say I uh, respectfully uh, disagree uh, with Willie Rennie. Uh, as I said, I think in this chamber last week, uh, assessments in uh, our primary schools, including in primary one, uh, are not new. Uh, 29 out of 32 councils already carried out assessments. In fact, many of these councils carried out two assessments every year. Uh, what the Scottish Government has done is standardised them so that all local authorities are using the same assessment and then made them relevant to the Curriculum for Excellence uh, levels, uh, which, of course, at primary one is a play-based curriculum. Uh, these assessments are not high stakes. There is no pass or fail to these assessments. And, of course, it's up to teachers when in the school year uh, pupils undertake them. And, of course, if a teacher doesn't think it's appropriate for any child to undertake them, that is entirely up to the teacher's discretion. Uh, and they provide important diagnostic information to inform teacher judgment about the performance of young people. You know, we set benchmarks for children in primary one, levels that we expect them to meet. Now, some people might disagree with that, but I've not heard disagreements to that in this chamber. We set benchmarks that we expect children to meet in primary one. I think it's absurd to suggest that we shouldn't then try to assess whether or not children are actually meeting these benchmarks, uh, because it then allows early intervention if necessary, if children are not performing as expected, but also it allows uh, a teacher to know whether a child is performing better than expected uh, and stretch that child rather than allowing them to get bored in the classroom. And we've seen, uh, of course, uh, educational experts, Sue Ellis, Lindsay Patterson, today uh, in a newspaper uh, talk about the importance of, of that benchmarking information. Uh, so I, I think we should take some of the politics out of this debate and actually focus on what's right for our children and what's right for education as a whole. Willie Rennie. Lindsay Patterson supports league tables, so it's shocking for the First Minister to claim that she's supporting his position. It sounds also, in fact she is, she's saying the EIS are wrong. Just last week the First Minister said she was listening to teachers, now she's ignoring them. The evidence is mounting, 170 pages of searing criticism from teachers, a damning letter from the EIS the waste of resource, the useless value of the information, the high stakes environment, the slippery path to league tables. Teachers are very clear. They've said the test should go. The union has said the test should go. When this parliament votes next week to scrap the primary one tests for pupils, will she respect the will of parliament and scrap the tests? She dodged the question last week. If the Parliament says stop, will she stop? First Minister. Well, firstly, uh, we will argue our case rigorously and robustly. That's what happens uh, in uh, a democracy. Uh, can I just take on some of the points Willie Rennie has raised, though? Because I I'm not saying the EIS is wrong. I'm saying I have a difference of opinion with the EIS. I think that is entirely, that is entirely legitimate. I have... I have spoken to many teachers who also have a difference of opinion about assessments. Let me read out some of the uh, teacher quotes from the survey that the EIS actually carried out 
of its members. And I know there were many quotes in that survey uh, who, that did not support standardised assessments. But here's some. Uh, data, the data is incredibly detailed and personalised. Feedback will be very useful in looking at next steps. Uh, really like the fact that there wasn't the use of timers to ensure that children were given thinking time and support if required. Uh, in P1, the assessments were carried out on iPads. The child often had no idea how they were being formally assessed. It worked well. Uh, the P1 numeracy task was appropriate and aligned with curriculum for excellence. I thought they fitted in quite well with levels and provided a range of questions. I, they, I know Willie Rennie doesn't want to hear what some teachers have actually said about standardised assessments. So there is... There is a difference of opinion and I accept that. But as I said earlier on, we set uh, benchmarks for how we expect our young people to perform uh, in primary one. I think it's incumbent of, on us to know whether that is the case. So the early intervention can be taken as required. I've said uh, very clearly on so many occasions, I want to see us raise standards in Scottish education and I want to see us close the attainment gap and we need data to inform the action we take to do that. So I will continue to make what I think is the common sense argument for this uh, and I look forward to the debate continuing. We have some further supplementaries. The first from Mark Ruskell. Thank you and uh, can I declare an interest as an associate member of the British Veterinary Association. The government's chief vet has claimed this morning that the practice of shipping live dairy calves on five-day journeys from Scotland to Spain is acceptable <coughs> and that criticism is alarmist. Is that the government's official position? And if not, then will the First Minister join me in congratulating P&O Ferries on their decision to ban live exports this week? First Minister. Well, this issue is extremely emotive. I think it is also uh, more complex than some of the coverage, and I, coverage, and I stress some of the coverage has given the impression of. I, I thought the Chief Vet uh, in the papers this morning actually set out quite clearly some of the facts uh, behind the claim of 100-hour uh, journeys. Uh, as uh, Marie Goujon has also set out in Parliament this week, uh, the issue here is that male dairy bull calves uh, don't have a, a market. Farmers don't have a market for them right now here in Scotland. Uh, if they're not exported for production, what happens is that they are slaughtered at birth. A small number are exported, uh, but farmers here want to find alternative markets domestically. Uh, welfare of animals is absolutely paramount. Uh, transport within the EU is subject to strict regulation, uh, and there is no hard evidence that those regulations are being breached. And as the member is aware, uh, the Scottish Government is currently carrying out a year-long monitoring project uh, that will look in more detail at this. So we will continue uh, to be very uh, rigorous as we observe this and continue to take whatever action we consider to be necessary. James Dornan. Thank you, Presiding Officer. John Lewis employs several thousand staff in Scotland. It faces challenging times with profits down 99%. The company cites Brexit uncertainty as a contributing factor. But Dominic Rabb says it's John Lewis's own fault, stating just this morning in the BBC that there's a temptation for business not doing well to blame Brexit. Does the First Minister agree the UK government should stop burying its head in the sand and accept that they are the ones putting our economy at risk? Yeah. First Minister. Well, I think with um, Dominic Rabb's comments uh, this morning, this clueless... Uh, incompetent uh, shambles of a Tory uh, UK government is really taking the biscuit. It really does beggar belief uh, that the Tories who are taking uh, the country in Scotland's case against uh, our democratic wishes out of the EU have the nerve to turn around and blame uh, businesses for raising concerns and say that they're using Brexit as some kind of an excuse. Uh, the sooner the Tory government get over their own ideological civil war and start putting the interests of businesses across the UK at the forefront of their considerations, frankly, the better for all of us. Yeah, yeah. Joanne Lamond. Thank you very much, presiding officer. The First Minister will be aware of the powerful and harrowing testimonies by survivors to the Scottish child abuse inquiry. Can I ask the First Minister how she responds to the concerns expressed by those, by those representing survivors of abuse about reports that legislation to create a survivor's compensation scheme may not be introduced until 2021, with implementation obviously much later still? Will the First Minister confirm that she will look at how the scheme could be taken forward with greater urgency? And will she make a commitment to create an interim compensation scheme 
in order that the many elderly and vulnerable survivors may secure the justice and support they need now and before it's too late for them. First Minister. Well, can, can I thank Joanne Lamott uh, for raising this really important issue. Uh, the stories of survivors uh, are extremely harrowing and of course this government set up the child abuse inquiry. Uh, the report around uh, survivors compensation of course was just received by the Scottish Government uh, last week. Uh, as I think all members would understand we are taking uh, the time to consider the recommendations in that report uh, very very carefully but also extremely sympathetically. I cannot give uh, Joanne Lamont the specific answers to her questions today because we are still considering uh, the report uh, but the Deputy First Minister will uh, come forward to Parliament in due course to set out the next steps but I, I would absolutely associate myself and the Scottish Government with the sentiment of the question that Joanne Lamont asked. George Adam. Thank you, President Officer. From today, Social Security Scotland will make the first payment of the new carers allowance supplement. The first devolved benefit to be paid, which recognises the important contribution carers make across Scotland. Will the First Minister outline the Scottish, that this, how the Scottish Government will continue to support carers and how it is building a social security system which has fairness and dignity at its heart? First Minister. Well, today is a, a landmark moment in the history of devolution and it's one that we probably should uh, take a moment to celebrate. Uh, today uh, the first payments will be made by our new executive agency Social Security uh, Scotland uh, through the Carers Allowance Supplement. Uh, that Carers Allowance Supplement will put an extra £442 a year into the pockets of carers in this financial year. That's an increase of 13% and a total investment of more than £30 million a year. So I actually think this is something of a proud moment for this Parliament and indeed uh, for Scotland. Uh, we will continue uh, to take forward our new social security uh, powers. That will include uh, looking at additional support for carers. But as I said in the programme for government last week, uh, we also uh, hope to deliver the pregnancy and baby payments of the new Best Start grant uh, before uh, Christmas. Uh, again, another milestone in uh, this Parliament taking some power over social security. Uh, let me just end uh, by saying uh, that I hope it won't be too much uh, into the future before this Parliament has total control over Social Security because I think as we are already proving uh, this Parliament uh, would make a far better job of it than Westminster is currently managing. Question number four, Stuart Stevenson. To ask the First Minister what discussions the Scottish Government has had with the UK Government regarding reports that an estimated 1,000 miles of roads in Scotland have no mobile phone signal. First Minister. Mobile telecommunications, of course, is a reserved matter and it is therefore the responsibility of the UK government to improve coverage. It is uh, worth, I think, pointing out that the UK government's failed mobile infrastructure project promised 84 masts to cover uh, what are called not spots, but managed to deliver the grand total of three. Uh, however, at his recent meeting with the UK Secretary for Digital, Michael Matheson raised the issue of roadside mobile connectivity. We pressed in particular to see progress made in the Home Office's Emergency Services Mobile Communications Programme, which has been beset with delays, and we await from them confirmation of the proposed approach to delivery. But also because we can't uh, wait for Westminster to deliver decent mobile connectivity in rural Scotland, we have created our own mobile infrastructure plan, committing £25 million to improving 4G coverage. We've recently awarded uh, a contract for this programme and the supplier is currently working towards delivery of the initial 16 sites in remote parts of Scotland. Stuart Stevenson. Uh, I very much welcome the £25 million that the Scottish Government has put into improving uh, mobile telephony in Scotland. But as we know, the UK Government has little understanding and less interest in Scotland. Is it now time for responsibility and the associated funding for mobile telephony be completely devolved? First Minister. Uh, yes, absolutely. You know, there is a pattern uh, that emerges sometimes where matters are reserved. We've just been talking about welfare. Uh, the UK government doesn't get its act together and fails to deliver. And then the Scottish government has got to step in to do Westminster's job for it. That's been true in aspects of welfare. It's now true on mobile connectivity. So I think it's about time we cut out the middleman in all of this and just devolve these powers to Scotland so that we can get on with it ourselves. Question number five, Liz Smith. 
to ask the First Minister what action the Scottish Government will take to improve the implementation of the 1 plus 2 modern languages policy in broad general education. First Minister. We are already taking action to increase the pace of implementation of the 1 plus 2 modern languages policy in the broad general education. Since 2013-14, we have provided a total of £27.2 million in additional funding to support its delivery. Alongside this, we have provided funding each year to Scotland's National Centre for Languages to support schools and local authorities in delivering 1 plus 2. Information provided by local authorities in April shows that at least 91% of primary schools are meeting pupils' entitlement to learning a first additional language from P1 onwards, and at least 62% of secondary schools are providing learning of a first additional language from S1 to S3. Liz Smith. Uh, thank you for that, First Minister. The Telegraph reported at the weekend that 38% of the secondary schools in Scotland are not implementing the 1 plus 2 programme. You've just confirmed that uh, yourself, and that's despite the £27 million that you've just referred to. And that's at the same time as the number of teachers in modern languages has declined by 20% in the last 10 years, and the number of entries for SQA levels 3 to 5 in French and in German have fallen by 60% and 58% respectively in the last five years. Will the First Minister admit that the Scottish Government's languages policy is not working nearly well enough and that it is yet another example of why there is an urgent need to review subject choice under the Curriculum for Excellence? First Minister. Uh, no, I don't, I, I don't agree with that. Uh, we have work to do. Uh, the 38%, of course, was uh, the, the other side of uh, my articulation of 62% uh, that that are, uh, but we will continue to make progress on delivering one plus two. But I think just to give some context here in terms of performance overall uh, about language education, the total entries of language hires are up 2.6% uh, since 2007. The total passes uh, of language hires are up 6.3% uh, since 2007. Uh, this is the fifth year that language hire entries have exceeded 7,500 Overall, statistics published last December show that total teacher uh, numbers are uh, increasing. So there's lots of progress uh, to look at. But of course, we want to continue to do more because we know that language learning helps to build confidence. It helps to foster interest in other cultures and it encourages uh, tolerance and uh, respect, which I know that not all people in the Conservative Party are keen on, uh, but we are very keen on it on these benches. Gordon MacDonald. The SNP set out its one plus two languages policy in our 2011 manifesto, and I'm pleased to hear today of the progress being made. I also took the time to search the Conservative Party manifesto of 2011, 2015, 2016 and 2017, and cannot find a single mention of foreign language teaching. The one plus two policy would never have been implemented by the Tories. Does the First Minister agree that the Tories' only guiding principle is to attack the SNP, even at the expense of our children's education? Yeah. On language policy, First Minister. Well, I think that is a point very well made by Gordon MacDonald. Uh, not a mention of modern languages in any of their manifestos, although I would uh, remind Gordon MacDonald that even as we know now from standardised assessments, even if it had been in their manifesto, it wouldn't have mattered to the Tories because they would have jettisoned it at the first opportunity to inflict a defeat on the SNP. Uh, political opportunists, uh, that's what the Tories are. We are concerned about the interests of children in our schools and that will be, continue to be uh, what stands between us. Ian Gray. Presiding officer, the First Minister really is in denial about this. The precipitous decline in both enrolment and attainment in certain modern languages has been tracked now over a number of years. These skills are critical to the economic future of this country and to our children's capacity to participate uh, in that future. Will she take her head out of the sand, admit that we have a problem, and tell us what she's going to do about it? First Minister. Well, if Ian Gray had chosen to listen, uh, he would have heard me say that I think we've got much uh, more work to do because it's so important to our economy, it's so important to the confidence uh, of our young people and it's important uh, in terms of interests in other countries and other cultures. So I've set out some of the progress, uh, but we will continue to invest and uh, to support local authorities and schools in making the further progress that we all want to see. Question number six, Jackie Bailey. To ask the First Minister, in light of the David Hume Institute report, Wealth of the Nation, 
what action the Scottish Government will take to improve productivity. First Minister. Raising productivity growth is vital to boosting our long-term economic performance. As the report highlights, Scotland's productivity is the highest in the UK behind London and the South East. It also shows that amongst the UK's city regions, Aberdeen and Edinburgh have higher productivity than anywhere outside of London. And of course, in the last 10 years, Scotland has largely closed the productivity gap with the rest of the UK. Uh, but we know that more needs to be done to match the levels of productivity in top performing European countries, which is why we set out further policies in the programme for government to boost productivity. These include a commitment to invest an additional £7 billion over and above existing plans on schools, hospitals, transport, digital connectivity and clean energy by 2026. Jackie Bailey. Can I thank the First Minister for her response? Comparing ourselves to the rest of the UK, whose performance has indeed been woeful, is not desperately ambitious. But since 2007, every SNP-led administration has set a target for improving productivity, and rightly so, but that target has been missed completely. We were to be in the top quartile of OECD countries for productivity by 2017. That's equivalent of getting promoted to the Premier League. But instead, instead we've been relegated to the third division. Not improvement, not improvement, but it's actually gone in reverse and productivity is effectively flatlined. So what specific lessons will she take from the David Hume Institute report to improve productivity and drive growth in Scotland? First Minister. Well, we will continue to invest in infrastructure. We will continue to inv uh, increase our investment in business R&D set out in last year's programme for government and continuing just now. We will continue to take the action that we have set out on growing exports. But, you know, Jackie Bailey says uh, we shouldn't compare ourselves to the rest of the UK. I'm, I'm going to place a small bet here. If Scotland was doing worse than the rest of the UK on this measure, Absolutely. I think Labour would want to compare Scotland to the rest Absolutely. of the UK. But... You know, if she'd listened to my original answer, she would have heard me say that, yes, we've closed the gap with the rest of the UK, but our aim is to match the level of productivity in the top performing European countries. That is exactly what we are working to do. Uh, we've, uh, in the first quarter of this year, productivity has increased by 1.7%. Productivity growth it has, as I said, been higher than any other country or region of the UK, including uh, London. And look at the David Hume uh, report. Uh, for example, it says, and I'm quoting from it here, among UK regions, Scotland is behind only London and the South East for productivity. Uh, it goes on to say financial services are more productive than in all other parts of the UK. Similarly, Scottish manufacturing uh, is more productive than the UK average. Uh, so there is good news in our progress in productivity, but we will continue to make the investments to get us to the level of other European countries. Dean Lockhart. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer. The Economy Committee recently found that uh, over the past 10 years, the SNP has failed to reach all seven of its own economic targets, including for productivity. Does the First Minister agree with the findings of the Economy Committee and does she accept responsibility for her government failing to meet every one of its own economic targets? First Minister. I can't actually believe that uh, the member has managed to miss the financial crash and the recession that has happened uh, and austerity that has happened over these times. But, but if he wants to talk about economic performance, let's talk about economic performance. On the most recent statistics, uh, we know that last year the Scottish economy grew faster than the economy in the rest of the UK. Uh, we know that unemployment is close to a record uh, low. We know that employment levels are close to a record high. We know that for female uh, employment and youth employment, we're performing better than the rest of the UK. Export growth in Scotland uh, is faster than the rest of the UK. We've closed the productivity gap. So yes, uh, there's lots to be positive about in our economic performance. We've got more to do, but the biggest threat to our economic performance is Tory Brexit. Yeah. And that's the reality the Tories really need to wake up to. Question number seven, Shona Robison. To ask the First Minister how the Scottish Government will mark the official opening of the V&A Dundee. First Minister. Well, the opening of the V&A Dundee on Saturday heralds an exciting new chapter for the city of Dundee. It's a fantastic addition to the diverse array of cultural experiences that Scotland has to offer, promoting our nation globally and attracting visitors and investment. 
Uh, the Scottish Government has been a long-term supporter of the project with substantial financial investment in the building's construction and operation. Uh, a number of uh, Scottish Government ministers are participating in opening events this week and I myself look forward to touring the building with some of Dundee's young people tomorrow. Gina Robertson. Uh, last night I saw the inside of the v and Dundee for the first time and I can tell the First Minister she's in for a real treat tomorrow night. Will the First Minister join with me in thanking all of the public and private sector partners who have worked so hard over the last 10 years to make the v and Dundee dream into a reality and can she say what she expects the transformational impact for Dundee to be from this iconic project and the significant investment made by the Scottish Government and other funders to deliver it and finally what she thinks could be the next thing for Dundee in its renewal journey. First Minister. <laughs> Uh, well, I agree absolutely uh, with Shona Robison. Um, yes, I, I do want to congratulate all of the public uh, and private sector partners. This is an astonishing achievement. Of course, the Scottish Government has been a significant funder. We've provided £38 million towards construction and also provided almost £7 million in revenue funding to date. Um, I am looking forward to seeing it tomorrow from the pictures uh, and footage that I've seen. It looks absolutely stunning. In terms of its... Uh, transformational potential for the city of Dundee. I think it's probably quite hard to overstate what that might be. It puts Dundee firmly on the cultural map of the world. It will attract uh, more visitors to Dundee. I'm sure it will attract uh, more investment uh, into Dundee. So I think the city of Dundee has every reason right now to feel incredibly optimistic about the future. The Scottish Government is very ambitious for Dundee and looks forward to making additional investments in Dundee. And I look forward to being pressed to do exactly that by Shona Robison uh, over the months uh, and years to come. Thank you very much. That concludes First Minister's questions. We're going to move on to members' business shortly in the name of Linda Fabiani on East Kilbride workers said nay passeran. But we're going to take a few moments for the uh, gallery in particular to change. Uh, so if members could move out quietly and I'll suspend shortly, I'll suspend for a few minutes to allow that to happen. Parliament is suspended for a few minutes. <laughs>